This is an introductory lecture on equal protection. It is introductory because uh, a number of the areas that I will introduce and explain, there are subsequent lectures or is a subsequent lecture which provides more detail about that. Now I'm going to conduct uh, this as though I am uh, about to write an answer to a bar exam question. And if I'm presenting with this equal protection question, what I would want to think about and to mention in my answer is where do these equal protection rights come from? Secondly, if you got an equal protection right, what, is, what does that mean? What's the rule? And uh, some examples, I'd want to have some examples in mind of what the rule is and what are the examples of equal protection. Then I'd compare the facts in the bar question against uh, uh, examples that I know and I would make my decision about uh, whether or not equal protection has been violated. Now, so to begin with then, we want to look at where do these equal protection rights come from? And what I would have in mind that makes a clear presentation of this is something like, you don't need to say all this, but you need to think this and say certain parts of it. And what I would think is the following, and I'd say, well, uh, you know, uh, where do these rights come from? Well, the former colonies, let's go all the way back to here, when they created the central government, the former colonies delegated certain power to do governmental acts to the central government. And then, in the first ten amendments, which followed right away, there was a list of things that the government should not do. So the Constitution says, here's what you do. The first ten amendments says, here's what you don't do. And let's take a look at those. First, the delegation of power to the government is in only six articles in the Constitution. So there are six articles. Article 1 says, legislative body, here's the stuff you can do. You can create armies, you can create navies, you can provide for copyright protection, you can regulate commerce among the several states, you can create a postal system, you can do all those kinds of things. Uh, this is in Article 1, Section 8, and there's about 18 of these here. Secondly, Constitution says, Article 2, the executive branch, uh, you get to administer the laws of the country. You're a commander in chief of the military. You can appoint, make certain appointments and you can negotiate treaties and stuff like that. This is what the executive branch can do. Article 3 is the judiciary branch. You resolve controversies. Article 4 is a relationship between the states. This is where you get your full faith and credit clause and the privilege and immunities clause of the Article 4. Uh, the uh, Article 5 is about how to amend the Constitution. And Article 6 is basically the Supremacy Clause. This is the entire Constitution. And so, since this is what the government is authorized to do, then anything that the government does must be a rational attempt to do one of these things and nothing else. Okay? If the government is trying to do something that isn't one of these things, it's acting beyond the authority that was given to it, and that violates substantive due process. Now, in these first ten amendments to the Constitution that we call Common to Call the Bill of Rights, uh, here's a list of things that the state says, you central government, you shall not do these things. You shall not impair our right to free speech, our right to bear arms. Don't require us to quarter soldiers in time of peace. No unreasonable searches and seizures. Don't violate due process. Now. We're going to have to come back and talk about what this means. Your rights at criminal trials, rights at civil trials, no cruel and unusual punishments. And then finally, Articles 9 and, uh, 9 and 10, uh, Amendments 9 and 10, Amendments 9 says, uh, we gave you some stuff that you're not supposed to do, but we, th this is not everything that you're not supposed to do. In other words, we retain some other rights. Now, they're not identified in the Constitution, but it says in Article 9, we retain some other rights, the citizen. And Article 10 says the states still have all the power that wasn't delegated to the federal government. And so this is the Constitution. The Constitution and the First Amendment, and then comes the final ones that we care about for equal protection purposes, and that's Amendments 11 through 15. Amendment 11 says you cannot sue the state and federal court, and some qualifiers that come to that later on. Article, the Twelfth Amendment is about the electoral college process for electing the president and the vice president. We don't care about that. Article 13 says no more slavery. 
Article 14 says uh, the state, the state now, this is where it, all these other things have been saying the central government shall not do this and shall not do that and so forth. We're talking about the state now in Article 14, the 14th Amendment. No state shall deprive the person of due process or equal protection of the laws. Now here's our first real equal protection specific uh, provision in the Constitution. No state shall deny the person equal protection of the laws. And Article 15 says, or the 15th Amendment, former slaves can now vote. Now, you can see that there is no equal protection clause that applies directly against the federal government. The, our, the 14th Amendment applies to the states. So what the courts did is they went here to the 5th Amendment, which does apply against the federal government, and says we will interpret this due process clause of the 5th Amendment to include everything that's required of equal, in equal protection over here. So you get the same equal protection rights against the federal government as you got against the, the state, but it's done by interpreting the Fifth Amendment due process clause as to include those provisions. So we have two sources of equal protection, the state and the federal government shall deny the person equal protection of the laws. And when you do this on a bar exam, you, if it, you should point out the difference. If it's a federal government acting, it's really the Fifth Amendment. If it's a state, uh, it's the 14th Amendment. No state shall deprive equal protection. Now also at this point, I might mention that this is also the time uh, when you would look at, you, you look at, do we have state action and, and standing? The state action question it comes up because the state shall not deprive you of equal protection or the federal government shall not deprive you of equal protection. So whoever it is that deprived the person of equal protection, that person has got to be either this or some governmental body. And it's obviously a governmental body if you've got some employee of the government acting on behalf of the government. You have a police officer, you have a judge, you have a, school te a public school teacher, you have a, a public, uh, the operator of the public elevator and a public, build, a public uh, office building of some sort. Anyone employed for the government and acting on behalf of the government, of course, within the scope of their employment, that person is acting for the government and so you have state action, no problem about that. The marginal cases of state action involve those cases where you know, the company town, where the company's bought the whole town, and now when you go out on the sidewalks, well, the, the court says, since you own the town, you've got to treat the sidewalks like, like people have their, their First Amendment rights there. And so that's one kind of a, a borderline case of state action. And another one is where the state is so involved in the conduct that they treat it as though it's state action. It happened in the Wilman Parkinson lot case, remember? that the state uh, of Maryland was, uh, was benefiting from uh, the restaurant. They had get sharing in the profits from the restaurant, but the restaurant was discriminating, and the court treat that as state action because the state was so involved in the activities of the restaurant that uh, their conduct was state action. On the other hand, the mere fact that someone gave someone a license to cut hair, that person's cutting hair is not state action. So issuing a license isn't, but being intimately involved and um, and the company town cases. Other than that, uh, state so so do you have state action? And uh, be sure that it is uh, either the state or the federal government that's doing the acting. Then you look to standing. Does this person who is suing the one who's really injured? And there you get the issues of does this person have standing? You know the the, the injury in fact, the causation and uh, and redressability. And then you look for third party standing, you look for associational standing. So does the person who's suing have standing? Is the defendant that you're suing either the state or the federal government? Let me point out these two places where it came from. And then this is also a good time to deal with stuff like ripeness and mootness. Or have you waited too long so that the case is moot? Have you waited not long enough so the facts haven't developed so it isn't ripe yet? Abstention doctrine, uh, where you may have to wait for a state court to resolve certain issues before you can proceed in federal court and the adequate and independent state grounds cases where the case has already been discovered, determined, the case was determined on adequate and independent state grounds, in which case there'd be nothing for the Supreme Court to review. So these, these procedural issues that might keep you from getting into the federal court, uh, this is a good time to discuss them. But the standing and state action, you have to discuss them. Here's where you get your state action from, you get your standing the way we talked about. So if you have standing and state action, there's no other reason not to get in federal court, then the next question becomes, uh, these people say, uh, are claiming that their equal protection rights were violated. So how do we decide that? What, 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 you know, what is the rule for deciding, for determining 
whether or not someone's equal protection rights were violated. Well, let's take a look at that. Now, uh, equal protection, first of all, uh, means that people who are similarly situated with respect to the purpose of a statute must be treated equally. And what do we mean by this? This is a very important term. Similarly situated is a term of art in the world of equal protection, so you need to use it if you can. Now, let us suppose, to, in order to clarify this, let's suppose that uh, two cars are driving down the street and they're both driving 25 miles an hour in a 30 mile zone and they're driving equally identically to each other, equally carefully, etc. And, and now, it, neither of these people is violating the law. And they're, they're, so, with, so these triple people are similarly situated with respect to the purpose of your law. The purpose is safety. Don't speed. It's a 30 mile zone. So the purpose is safety. And these two people driving 25 miles an hour equally safe are similarly situated with regard to safety. There's no treating them differently won't advance safety at all. So they're similarly situated with regard to safety. That's what we mean by this term. So the basic rule of, of equal protection is that those who are similarly situated with respect to the purpose of a law must be treated equally. Secondly, what about the people who are not similarly situated with respect to the purpose of the law? For example, let's suppose that one of these cars in my hypothetical is driving at 35 miles an hour, the other one is driving at 25 miles an hour. And so they are not similarly situated with respect to the purpose, which is safety. And so now you can treat them differently. Okay? But the rules about treating them differently is what equal protection is all about. And the rule is that you can treat them differently since they're not similarly situated with respect to the purpose of the law, which is safety. You can treat them differently. But the classification scheme must be a rational way to promote safety. So what's this classification scheme? Well, let me tell you what it is. The classification scheme is always the criteria that you used for classifying people. In my case, you're driving over 30 miles an hour or not. One person driving over 30, one driving under 30. That's my criteria. So the criteria and the treatment. What do I do to the person who's driving over 30? So what's the criteria? Don't drive over 30. And what's, what am I going to do to the person? Some kind of fine or something. And that's your classification scheme. What criteria do you use to classify the people? And what do you do to the ones that did what the losers, the ones that did what you didn't want them to do? That's your classification scheme. That combination of things how you select the people and what you're going to do to them has to be a rational way to promote the purpose of the law. Now remember, if this is a federal law, the only possible purposes that federal laws can have are those uh, that are listed in the Constitution we told you about. The only possible purpose, the only legal, only legitimate purposes of state laws are to promote health, welfare, safety, or morals. That's the police power. they got to be rational ways to promote health, welfare, safety, and morals of the citizens. Otherwise, the state is acting beyond the authority that was given to it. And so the, uh, uh, if someone, uh, so the law has a, has a purpose, to promoting safety or something in my case. Criteria was how fast were they going above or below the speed limit, what are we going to do to them, and that combination of things, we're going to penalize the person who's driving over 30, and that's a rational way to get people to drive safer. Now, uh, there are lots of examples from real uh, cases, and let's talk about some of those because they really help to clarify what goes on here with equal protection. Take the case of the truck ads. It's a New York case. And this is a case where the city of New York says, look, you know, we've got all of these companies that are hiring people who've got trucks to put signs about their company, advertising their company, on their truck. And so when you drive these trucks down the streets, there's a whole lot of advertising signs grabbing for people's attention, and it's causing accidents. And so New York says, we're going to pass a law, and they did pass a law, that says you can have an advertising sign on your truck that belongs to you about your business, but you can't have somebody else's advertising signs on your truck. And so now, in that case, is that law... Uh, 
the two the, the people who have advertising signs on their own, of their own and those who have other people's ads on their trucks these this is the criteria for treating for we're going to treat them differently and what are we going to do if you got somebody else's sign we're going to punish you in some way and so the question is is that classification scheme using that criteria is that your sign is somebody else's and we're going to treat you bad if you also if it's somebody else's sign is that a uh, a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental purpose. For the legitimate state purpose was safety, health, welfare, safety, morals, safety. And so is this a rational way to promote safety? Yes, it is. Uh, and therefore, uh, it does not violate equal protection. Uh, take the case of the no food stamps for strikers. Now, this is the case where some people were on strike, and the, uh, as a federal case, the people were on strike, and the, the people who were on strike went to the food stamp program and said, uh, we have no income, we'd like some food stamps, please. And the food stamp program, federal food stamp program, says, no, we won't give you any food stamps. Uh, now, and they sued. They say, well, you give food stamps to people who don't have income, and uh, we don't have income because we're strikers. Other people don't have income because so they don't have a job. And so, you are distinguishing between us. So the criteria for distinguishing us is those of us who are strikers without income and those who are not strikers without income. And so that's the criteria for, for, for treating them differently. And now what are you going to do to the people who are on strike? Answer, no food stamps for you. No food stamps. And so is that combination of drawing the line at you got to, you're striking or you're not uh, and not giving food stamps to those who are striking, okay, is that a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental interest? Well, the governmental interest in this case was to appear neutral in a strike. The government doesn't want to take sides in the strike. And if they're feeding the people on one side, that's taking sides. So wanting to maintain the appearance of neutrality in the strike is a legitimate governmental purpose. This was federal, and that game comes under the Commerce Clause. Commerce, the Labor Department is under the Commerce Clause and the Labor Department wants to appear neutral in the strike, and so under the Commerce Clause power uh, to uh, the, the court, the one of their purposes is for the government to remain neutral, and uh, so that's a legitimate government purpose, and what they're doing, not giving food stamps, is rationally related to a legitimate governmental purpose. Take the case of the civil service employment for, for civil service preference for vets. And this is a Massachusetts case where the... Uh, uh, they said, look, you know, you people who went out and fought World War II, we want to give, you want to come back, you come back and you're out of service and you're looking for a job, you want to work for the civil service, we will give you some preference, we'll give you extra points on your civil service exam if you are a veteran, discharge honorably. And so, uh, it seems like a nice thing to do. But then it turns out, of course, that in World War II, you know, 93% of the veterans were men. So if a woman wanted to get a job working for civil service, uh, you know, she couldn't compete because the men were veterans and they got some extra points for being a veteran. And so very few women, so, so women sued, saying, hey, this violates equal protection. And so the deal is, is this. Uh, the, the court, the, they say, you're violating equal protection. The criteria is whether you're a veteran or not. And the treatment is you get 10 points extra if you're a veteran on your exam. Well, uh, the, and so is that a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental interest? Using that criteria, are you a veteran or not, and giving you some extra points, is that a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental purpose? Well, I think so. I mean, the, the court thought so also. The state purpose of promoting health, welfare, safety, and morals, and you can say, People who are veterans, and we want to reward them in some way, nothing wrong with that. It contributes to the welfare of uh, people. And so uh, rewarding veterans seems reasonable. So giving these veterans the extra 10 points or so was a reasonable way to promote a legitimate governmental interest. But the women say, but we're victims because we can't fit that criteria. And the rule is that the women in this situation would have to prove that the, that the government did this for the purpose of discriminating against women. Now, the fact that you know, women suffer from it more than men do is not the point. You have to prove that the people who decided to give these benefits to veterans 
were really trying to advance the welfare of men over women, not veterans over non-veterans. And, and so the women would have to prove that in order to have this treated like gender discrimination. And of course they could not prove that and therefore the, the law stood. Uh, the, the rezoning cases. These are cases in Arlington, Virginia where uh, there is a community in Arlington where it's got all these fancy you know, single family homes, expensive upper class communities. So, and someone applied for a building permit to build low income housing in the middle of that community. And the permit was denied. And the person says, well, you know, you denied the permit on the basis of race because low income housing is going to have some minorities in there and the real reason you won't give me the permit is because you're trying to keep the minorities out of the community. Well, indeed, not issuing the, the low income housing permit had that effect, but the person would have to prove that that was the intent, that it was the intent of this law limiting the zoning here to single family dwellings, they have to prove that it was the intent of this law to discriminate against minorities in order to have that law treated as race discrimination. And they couldn't prove that and they lost. Uh, the uh, the uh, nine year social security rule is another example. If you're married to someone for more than nine years before that person's death, you can collect the surviving spouse can collect that person's social security benefits. But if they're married to the person less than nine years before the person died, then they cannot collect the death benefits of the uh, deceased spouse. And the, uh, so does that violate equal protection? Well, let's see. The criteria is married nine years or not, and the treatment is you don't get any death benefits if you're married less than nine years. Is that classification scheme, is that a reasonable way is that plan, dividing people up this way, nine years or more, and then not giving the extra money to the, to the ones who are married less than nine, does that plan promote a lawful governmental purpose? And yeah, it prevents fraud, because otherwise you know, people could get married you know, while the person's on their deathbed in the hospital and collect all the Social Security money. So it helps to prevent fraud. So that's a rational way to promote this uh, interest, and therefore, since it, since it was a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental interest, it does not violate equal protection. The nine-year Social Security rule does not violate equal protection. Methadone uses the New York case where the New York Transportation Authority said, look, we will not hire people who are on methadone as drivers, as transportation drivers, hauling the public around on these buses. And the methadone people who are recovering from heroin addiction the methadone people said, why are you picking on us? There are lots of other people who are on all kinds of other drugs, you know, aspirins and everything else, and you don't prevent them from driving the bus, and why us? And New York said, well, uh, not allowing methadone users, the classification scheme is you're either methadone user or not, and what we're going to do to you is we're not going to give you a license. Now, does that combination of if you're a methadone user and we don't give you a license, does that promote uh, a legitimate governmental purpose? The answer is safety, and it does promote a legitimate governmental purpose, and therefore this classification scheme of dividing people up this way and treating them this way, that classification scheme does not violate equal protection. Uh, here's an example. There was, Illinois had a rule that said, you know, if you are a disabled person, and you make a claim for some disability benefits, uh, and if we, the state of Illinois, if we don't process your claim within 120 days, your claim is void. Now, you heard me right. Illinois said, if we don't process your claim within 120 days, then you lose your, your rights. And obviously, I mean, that is not, ra that rule is not rationally related to any governmental purpose. And so that's an example of a rule which simply was not even rational. Now you've seen a number of classification schemes. You've seen a classification scheme where the criteria was, uh, does the sign on the truck about your business or somebody else's? Are you a striker that wants food stamps or you're not a striker? Uh, are, are we, the, the nine year rule for social security, were you married nine years or not? Are you on methadone or not? In the case of rezoning, are you applying for a permit for a single family or a 
low-income house multifamily dwelling. And we won't give you one of them, and we'll give you the other. But as long as the state has a rational reason, and uh, for, it doesn't violate equal protection, unless the people can successfully claim that the alleged rational reason for not giving this person the permit for multifamily uh, dwelling in this single family area, the main reason was racism. The main reason was, was really uh, they're dividing people on the basis of race and they're just using the zoning kind of like a code word. But the person who claims that has got to prove it. And if you can't prove that, then the state only has to show that they have a rational reason for not giving this person the permit to build multifamily dwelling. Same thing with civil service. The state had a rational reason for giving vets uh, benefits, and it happened to fall. The burden fall, fell heavily on women, but unless the women can prove that the state did that with the intent to uh, discriminate against them, then uh, the, you, will, you will not be able to use the gender standards. So we've seen this now. So we've got all these reasons as to how to form classification schemes. And what about this one? Uh, gender. If you're male, then we'll do one thing for you. And if you're female, you do something else. And the court says, now wait a minute. We've, we've used lots of criteria along here. Striker, not striker, whose ads are on your truck, how long you've been married. But whether you're male or female, how about using that for a criteria? And the court says, now wait a minute, wait a minute. We've had some bad experiences with people using male and female for the criteria. We end up with situations where the women get less paid for the same work and, and they don't get the promotions and they don't get hired and on and on and on. And so if you're going to treat males one way and females another, then the, the court says, then, you know, we're going to look very closely at what you're doing to be sure that, that you're not just carrying out that old stereotype. And so if your gender is going to be the standard, the criteria that you use, then the government must be trying to achieve an important governmental purpose, not just a legal one, but an important one. And an important one can be named as a substantial governmental purpose, a significant governmental purpose, an important governmental purpose, they all mean the same thing. And the law that you're, you're applying must be closely fitted to achieve that purpose, or substantially related to achieving that purpose, significantly related. So it's a much tighter fit required to an important governmental purpose if you're going to divide by gender. And now, if you have a rule that says we're going to treat women this way and men that way, you're obviously dividing by gender. But if you have a rule that says we're going to treat vets this way and non-vets this other way, well, it doesn't say you're dividing by gender, but it may amount to that. But in those situations, the women would have to prove that this vet uh, benefit was really just kind of a code word for discriminating against women. And they have the burden of proving that with the preponderance of the evidence. So if you use gender for the criteria, then uh, these are the higher standards. If you use race for the criteria or national origin for the criteria, then the standards are even higher. What the state is doing, must, the state must have a compelling interest in that and no other way of doing it necessary to achieve a compelling governmental interest. And there aren't very many places where that works anymore. One of the few places might be in prisons where you have race riots going on frequently and if you, you know, bet somebody down in the wrong group, they might get killed. And so the, uh, it may be that there are prisons where that's still true now, but otherwise you really can't get much of this uh, uh, based on race. Finally, there is one other case where strict scrutiny is applied, this compelling necessary to achieve a compelling governmental interest is called strict scrutiny. And there are another set of cases where strict scrutiny applies, and they come from a kind of different source. I have them listed here, voting, travel, access to courts, and the explicitly fundamental rights. But I listed them over here so you can see them more easily. Voting, travel, access to courts, and the explicit fundamental rights. Now, what's going on here is we're going to apply strict scrutiny, but we're going to do it for a different reason. In the past, we've applied strict scrutiny when the classification criteria was race, uh, when the classification criteria was alienage. But remember, the classification scheme involves two parts. What is your criteria for classifying people? 
And second, what are you going to do to the people once you classify them? And so if you classify people by race, strict scrutiny. You classify them by gender, uh, intermediate scrutiny. If you classify them any other way, rational basis on the classification part. But what about the part of what are you going to do to people after you classify them? And if you're going to diminish their vote, then strict scrutiny is going to apply because voting is a fundamental right. And so if you, for example, gerrymander the, some districts in such a way that you had one district that was large enough to, uh, large, one, one district of minorities that was large enough so that uh, this district could put one person on the city council, uh, you know, if they kind of voted as a unit. Uh, but now the city uh, council uh, redistricts the town in such a way that this district, they could have elected one minority member of the board, now is broken up so that one part of this district is now in District 5, and another part of this minority district is now in District 8, and another part's in District 2, and so that this, it's not possible now for these people to elect anyone to represent their interest. Well, if you can show that that gerrymandering of the districts was done in order to weaken their vote, okay, got to show it, it was done in order to weaken the vote, then that gerrymandering of the district violates the right to vote because each vote should have equal weight and these people, their votes have been broken up in such a way as to diminish the effectiveness of their votes. Uh, gerrymandering uh, is what's happened here. Another example of voting where sometimes there will be a, a voting rule that some, says something like, uh, uh, you know, if you are a property owner, you get to vote in box A, and if you are not a property owner, you get to vote in box B, and that in order for a uh, bond issue to pass, both has got to pass both box A and box B. And the court says, come on, folks, forget it. No. That one person, one vote, and that's the way it is. Now, uh, right to travel. Uh, right to travel is another one of these where it, it doesn't matter what the criteria you use for deciding who can travel and who can't. That doesn't matter what the criteria is. The thing is that if you impair people's right to travel, that's a big deal. And the reason that's a big deal is because, remember, uh, the, the country is a nation. And part of what you mean by a nation is people can move around. You can go to Minnesota if you want to, go to Florida if you want to. Okay? Well, if you're poor and you want to move to Florida and they tell you in Florida, well, don't come here because when you get here, you can't get any welfare for the first year, even no matter how hard you're trying to get a job and all that, and what a good upstanding citizen you are. You can't get any welfare, and you can't get your children any free medical care for the first year. So that's like Florida saying, don't come here, or Montana saying, don't come here. Well, what kind of nation are you going to have when various states are saying, don't come here, unless you've got a lot of money or something? And so the, to protect this, this nation, this national uh, concept, Everybody's got to have a right to go in where they want to. And so if Montana puts up a law that's going to discourage you from immigrating there because you can't get medical care for your kids for the first year, that's like saying, don't come here. And so and the way that comes out in the law is everybody's got a right to travel, and if Montana does something to discourage you from immigrating there, then that impairs your right to travel, and that law is going to be void. And that's what the right to travel. And here, you don't have to prove intent, like you did with voting. You don't have to prove intent. Now, the voting, again, if you have a law that says if you're A, you vote this way, and B, you get vote, you don't have to prove that it was intended to affect voting. But it's when you're gerrymandering and pretending you weren't trying to affect voting, you got to prove that you intended to affect voting. Travel isn't like that. If you impair my right to go to Montana, to move and settle in Montana if I want to, then uh, whether you intended to do it, you did it indirectly, you did it by mistake, I don't care how you did it. If you did it, the courts are going to say, the question for this court is, are we going to allow Montana to interfere with people's right to migrate there that much? I don't care whether you're trying to do it or not. And so here, the right to travel, strict scrutiny applies. What Montana is doing must be necessary to achieving a compelling governmental interest. Very few things would pass that. Access to courts. Uh, if people want to assert their fundamental rights, uh, then you got, and, and the court's the only way to do it, you've got to let them get to court. And if they don't have the filing fees or something, you can't stop these people from exercising their fundamental rights because they don't have the filing fees. 
So you've got to give them access to courts in those kinds of cases. Also in cases where the court really controls the only means of them getting what they want. Somebody wants to get divorced. Well, nobody can divorce them except the courts. And you say, well, we charge a fee to get divorced. I haven't got any money. What do you do? Well, if the court's got control over the ability to get divorced, you've got to let people do it free if they don't have any money. Uh, uh, so access to courts and then the explicit fundamental rights. There are additional fundamental rights, you know, all the ones in the Bill of Rights of uh, First Amendment and so forth. And if your, if your state law impairs any of those fundamental rights, okay, no matter how, no matter what the criteria is for how you're going to form the groups, if you're going to, if one of the groups, if you're going to impair uh, their right to speak, then strict scrutiny is going to apply. There's a good example of that in Chicago. There's a high school called the Mosley High School. And uh, this is 1972 when the schools were discriminated or segregated, really. And so uh, this person who was a black postal worker, uh, every day uh, during his off hours would go and picket the Mosley School. And uh, he'd picket the Mosley School, and his picket sign said, uh, this school discriminates, this racially discriminates. And now there is a law that says you can't picket in front of school during school hours except if you're a labor union and you're picketing about a labor conflict with that school. And so the deal then and the criteria is that you can picket about labor disputes but you can't picket about racism at the school. And so uh, this person was arrested and so forth and got to court and the court said uh, that the criteria is whether you are carrying a picket sign about uh, labor dispute at that school or you're carrying a picket sign about the racism of the school, and that if that's your criteria, the state doesn't have a compelling justification. So that, that criteria is impairing this person's First Amendment rights. And since that criteria is impairing the First Amendment rights, we'll apply strict scrutiny to the whole thing. And there is no compelling justification for dividing, for distinguishing between picketing at the, uh, because of labor and picketing because of the racism of the school, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no compelling justification for distinguishing between those two. And therefore, the state has not met the burden of showing the compelling justification, and therefore the statute is void. So uh, what equal protection then is about, in summary, it's about, number one, where did the right, where did the right of equal protection come from? You know, this is no state shall deny the federal government shall deny the person equal protection. Distinguish between the Fifth Amendment cases, federal government, and the state cases, uh, 14th Amendment. So step one, we distinguish between these two, this one and this one. Um, then you determine that the person has standing. Then the question is, did you violate any of their equal protection rights? People who are similarly situated with respect to the purpose of the statute must be treated equally. People who are not similarly situated may be treated differently. And what you do uh, is that this treatment, uh, this is the classification scheme, and the, cl and the rule is that, uh, that if the classification scheme is a rational way to promote, the go to advance the goals of the statute, then it's perfect, then what the state has done is okay, unless you have some of these higher scrutiny cases. So the, the classification scheme is how do you form your criteria for who's in which group, and how do you treat the groups? And the combination of what you, how you form the group and what you do to them is the classification scheme. The classification scheme is rational for the case of ads on the truck because the legitimate purpose was safety, and this was a rational way to promote safety. Strikers, the government doesn't want to look like it's favoring one over the other, so that was a rational way to treat the, the strikers. Uh, the uh, main nine... Merit for nine years is a rational way to prevent uh, 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 a fraud. The methadone uses is a rational way to promote safety. In these two cases, the civil service preference case and the rezoning case, these are cases where the plaintiff said that really your rezoning is really rezoning on the basis of race. And here the civil service uh, preference says you really are giving preferences on the basis of gender. So in each case, the person who claims that has to prove it with a preponderance of the evidence. Otherwise, rational basis will apply. If you do have gender, uh, discrimination based on gender, the standard goes up. Important purpose, closely fitted. If it's based on race, 
necessary to a compelling governmental interest. And finally, we apply strict scrutiny in one other case, that's the cases where uh, the conduct has impaired voting, either because you, you directly you know, said this would, uh, it, usually what happens on the voting is there's been gerrymandering, and somebody's vote has been diminished because of some funny voting scheme. And if you can show that that scheme was intended to diminish the person's vote, then uh, strict scrutiny applies. If you cannot show that the other scheme was intended to impair the person's vote, then rational basis will apply. Uh, right to travel, strict scrutiny, access to courts. Uh, if, the, if the courts have the exclusive means of getting what the person wants, or are fundamental rights involved? And finally, uh, strict scrutiny applies to the other explicit fundamental rights, such as right to speech and so forth. So uh, now, there are uh, further lectures on equal protection that deal with some of the uh, subtleties. For example, there are a lot, in the case of the uh, rational basis, I want you to be aware of a lot more examples of when rational basis was applied, because a major part of doing an equal protection law analysis on a bar exam question, a major part is uh, deciding whether you should apply rational basis or middle tier or strict, uh, strict scrutiny. It's very important uh, that you make the arguments as to why you're picking one, one or the other. Then you might even have to do both if it isn't perfectly clear which standard you should pick. So uh, there are additional lectures on a number of these subtopics, uh, but this is the introductory to how equal protection works. I hope you understand that uh, what the purpose is and how it works, and we will get into more detail and more examples on some of the special, the uh, other lectures. That is the end of this lecture.